Hello, I'm uh, Rafael Espena, and uh, in this webinar, I will be presenting my experience about periodontally facilitated orthodontics. Why, when, and how we use corticotomy. In the past decade, two new frontiers have been explored and have offered new possibilities to enhance and facilitate orthodontic tooth movement. On one side, we have skeletal anchorage by the use of mini screws or temporary anchorage devices that help to eliminate or reduce undesired tooth movements or to achieve movements difficult or impossible with traditional appliances. On the other side, we have periodontal surgery on teeth to move called corticotomies with a reduction of the resistance to movement, reduction or elimination of periodontal damage in risky tooth movements, and also for an improvement of the final periodontal health of the teeth orthodontically moved and a possible acceleration of orthodontic tooth movement. The use of surgery to accelerate tooth movement was reported even back in 1900 in the Angles book. At that time, however, removal of bone behind the upper incisors to help solving protrusions in adult patients with an immediate tooth movement was proposed. Among the many authors that have proposed and published about corticotomies, Cole in 1959 and Suya in 1991 described similar surgeries where deep vertical mesial and distal cuts associated with complete or partial osteotomies were produced with the idea to create single blocks of bone and teeth. These blocks were to be moved using braces as handles. Movements were to be achieved rapidly in three, four months before the fusion of the bony, bony blocks. In the past decades, several attempts have been made to modulate, stimulate, or inhibit orthodontic tooth movement from pharmacological products to alveolar osteotomies. And it seems that the corticotomy works better than all the other attempts. In fact, in a recent systematic review, Long and uh, co-workers have shown that corticotomy are today the only safe and effective method to accelerate tooth movement. The new era of corticotomy started in 2001 when uh, the two brothers, Wilco, in a case report, have questioned the idea of tooth bone blocks. In this clinical research, vertical and horizontal corticotomies were performed in two patients and associated with bone graft. With CT scans pre and post surgery, the authors of this research found no movement of tooth bone blocks but a transient reduction or mineralization of the alveolar bone. These modifications were similar to those described by Frost in 1983 during healing of fractured bone, fractured bone and known regional accelerated phenomenon, RAP. The surgical technique used by the two brothers Wilco was subsequently evolved in periodontally accelerated Osteogenic Orthodontics, P-A-O-O. -O. The claims of this technique were, on one side, accelerated tooth movement reduction of the total treatment time, and on the other side, osteogenic modification with the transportation of the bony matrix and the final improvement of hard and soft tissue support of the teeth treated with orthodontics. And Finally, an increase of the short and long-term stability of the orthodontic treatment. These claims have been discussed and questioned in two point counterpoint articles published in 2013 on the American Journal of Orthodontics and Dentofacial Orthopedics. Five issues have been brought up in these, three, these two articles. The first issue has been about the acceleration of tooth movement. It seems that from the available literature, corticotomy is able to accelerate orthodontic tooth movement. 
but we don't know what happens in humans at a microscopic level yet. The animal models seem to differ when we consider small animals like rodents and big animals like dogs and monkeys. So we still don't know what happens in humans. The duration of uh, the rap reaction in the alveolar bone after the corticotomy is still unknown. It is speculated that it lasts as long as tooth movement is maintained. According to the clinical experiences of clinicians that have treated cases with corticotomy and frost studies, it seems more feasible that we can rely on a maximum of four, six months of accelerated bone metabolism. For this reason, Corticotomy may reduce treatment time, but is highly unpredictable, as you can see here. If treatment of a malocclusion is long, if treated in a conventional way, saving few months may be not worth the, the added expenses and morbidity. Cockage has nicely addressed it in an editorial published in 2008. This is why the term accelerated to define the surgical procedure of corticotomy is inappropriate to us. Corticotomy should not be combined to orthodontics with the only objective of accelerating orthodontic tooth movement and reducing treatment time. A faster treatment is just a bonus and the effect becomes really evident only in treatments that will be naturally short with conventional orthodontics. Ethically speaking, speed could be an important factor in orthodontic treatments, but certainly not at the expense of a good quality result. Corticotomy may be associated with other soft tissue grafting in specific cases. This grafting should increase the osteogenic capabilities, enhance treatment results, and help with stability. The dynamic situation of tissue regeneration procedures combined to moving teeth should be better than the static situation of osteointegrated implants or unmoved teeth. Unfortunately, there is still no scientific evidence about this. However, in many cases with thin art tissue and or thin gingival biotype where risky movements like buccal expansion or incisor proclination are planned, Grafting may be needed to reduce the risk of producing recessions, periodontal defects, or moving teeth in reduced periodontal areas. The term osteogenics is inappropriate as well, because improvement of the periodontal supports around the teeth or the areas in which the teeth need to be moved varies from case to case. The increased metabolism of the bone around the tooth produced by surgical alveolar decortication makes the tooth move faster and also more easily. An accelerated orthodontic tooth movement may be considered a synonym of facilitated orthodontic tooth movement. This is the major feature of corticotomy, to make complex tooth movements easier to achieve. So the TADs are to increase anchorage. Corticotomies on the other side can be used to reduce anchorage. And this is why we prefer to the terms PAOO, we prefer the term PFO for periodontally facilitated orthodontics. Several surgical modalities have been proposed, from the least aggressive, the fibrotomy, to the most aggressive one, the osteotomy. Even if all these procedures seem effective in producing a rap reaction at around teeth to move, no protocol has been codified and indications, contraindications, limitations have not been defined yet. Confusion with terms and definition also exists in the literature. We do believe that corticotomies are not all the same. First of all, the surgical procedures are different. We have divided them in two major groups. On one side, the flapless surgeries, and on the other side, the open flap surgeries. Among the flapless surgeries, we find fibrotomy, corticesion, piezocesion, osteoperforations, and piezopunctures. P 
Dissociation is the procedure that has encountered major favors in the literature. It is a procedure where vertical interproximal cuts between attached and free gingiva on the middle third of the roots of the teeth to move are produced with a 15 blade. Then with a piezo blade, cuts two, three, two, three millimeter deep in the, into the bone follow. Grafting is possible injecting via tunneling between the cuts. Defined as a minimally invasive, but certainly not minimally risky. This technique has been tested by us in few cases. Buccal expansion of the lower anterior segments, mesodistal movement of anterior teeth, and upper molar distalizations. And let me show you the cases. First of all, the buccal expansion of the lower anterior segments. As you can see here, we have a case with vertical incisors. and some other problems, we decided to procline the incisors, and we were afraid of creating problems. This is why we did the piezo seizure with some um, grafting. We have tried also in mesodistal movement of anterior teeth, like in this case, where we were moving the canines measly in contact with the lateral, and the, the canines were moving very slowly. We tried it also in, this, in the distalization of upper molars, and this is in a master thesis done at the University of Ferrara. And you can see here the results of distalizations. We do believe, at least to our experience, that there are surgical limitations of this approach of the piezo seizure. It may be dangerous to perform when teeth are crowded. Open initial alignment may be necessary before surgery. There may be limited visibility during the, the use of the piezo blade. There is a limited control of grafting in the apicocoronal direction, and there is also a need for optical extension of the attached gingiva. In treating patients, orthodontic limitations have been found. Tooth movements have always been tipping. It has been impossible to achieve a bodily movement. This outcome is probably related to a corticotomy limited to a middle third of the roots and to the buccal side alone. Most likely, the rap reaction does not extend around the entire root and especially to the apical area. And this is why we are not able to achieve a bodily movement. In the other group, we found the open flap surgeries. Open flap surgeries are generally preferred by us from both the surgical and the orthodontic point of view. When the flap is raised, an exact and extended evaluation of the surgical side and the quality, quantity of the bone is possible. It's easier to decide where to perform the cuts, where to place the grafts, where to be more aggressive or more delicate. When the pre-surgical diagnosis and treatment plan are made on a CBCT scan, the open view of the surgical side just integrates all the possible information needed by the surgeon to properly manage the corticotomy sites and the grafting materials. Done with it. The periodontally facilitated orthodontic procedures that we describe now and that we use in our practice is a procedure where corticotomy, a cut of the bony cortex, is produced either segmentally, as you can see here, on a tooth or a group of teeth, or extended to an entire arch or a quadrant. It is definitely different than an osteotomy where the cut is extended to the entire alveolus to create a body segment to distract. The objective of PFO is to take advantage of the rap reaction in the bone around the teeth to move following the alveolar decortication and only if needed Hard and soft tissue grafting is, adding to, is added to the corticotomy. The objective of PFO is to take advantage of the rap reaction in the bone around the teeth to move following the alveolar decortication. And if needed, hard and soft tissue grafting uh, are added to the corticotomy. The positive modification in the bone metabolism deriving from the periodontal surgery help achieving a facilitated and enhanced orthodontic movement. 
only if the case needs it, and this is an evaluation made by both the periodontist and the orthodontist at the beginning of treatment, techniques to generate, regenerate hard and soft tissues to positively remodel the alveolar structures to take advantage of the anti-inflammatory and pain reliever properties of the autologous growth factors from plasma platelets are used. Segmental and extended PFO require similar surgical and orthodontic management. Let's look at the surgery first. The corticotomy is produced with piezo surgery and possibly with personalized and calibrated inserts. And here we have a video, number two. Even if the alveolar decortication could be made with any surgical rotating burrs or so, piezo surgery is preferred because of the greater precision, greater safety when cutting in risky areas, better irrigation and cooling, greater comfort for the patient, better healing processes. As you can see here in the video, corticotomy performed in the upper arch in the anterior area. The cuts are made wherever possible, both vertically in the interproximal areas, as you can see here, Look how precise is the plate during the vertical cuts. In these schemes, you can see that we do vertical cuts in the proximal areas, and always horizontal cuts in the supraapical areas. And on the buccal cortical plates, in between the vertical cuts, Bone is usually scraped to stimulate ample bleeding in order to have situations like this on the fourth um, slide. Again, I'll show you, we always do vertical cuts interproximally together with horizontal cuts in the supraapical area. As you can see in this video, there are vertical cuts done in the interproximal areas, in the entire area where we want to have a facilitated tooth movement. The vertical cuts are always associated with the horizontal cuts in the sub supra or subapical areas. In case of grafting, these vertical cuts associated with the supraapical horizontal cuts and the scraping will produce an excellent bed where to place the grafting. Surgery depends on the type of orthodontic tooth movement desired by the orthodontist. We can uh, need uh, bodily movements or non-bodily movements. If a bodily movement is planned during the following orthodontic treatment, the corticotomy should be produced on both lingual and buccal areas. If a non-bodily movement is acceptable, corticotomy only around the teeth to move and in the direction of the movement should be enough. Grafting is planned before surgery, but quality and quantity could be modulated at the surgery depending on the anatomical condition of the surgical site and the planned orthodontic tooth movement. Grafting of our tissue is usually a composite material where osteoinductive properties of human bone are usually combined to the osteoconductive properties of bovine bone. 
Grafting of soft tissue needs a careful evaluation. As a general rule, autologous connective tissue grafts are preferred if the areas to regenerate are small, whereas human as acellular dermal matrix allograft from cadavers is the choice for large areas. And here we have two videos. In this video, we are showing a matrix, a thin one, placed in the upper arch. And before placing it, this uh, allograft is uh, re-dry dated with the growth factors. In this other video, we are using a similar matrix, but it's a lot thicker. And of course, I can see here it's placed on top of the art uh, tissue graft and always with growth factors. The grafts are usually sutured with resorbable sutures. Hard and soft tissue grafts are generally combined with growth factors from autologous plasma platelets. There are many techniques. We like to use either one of these two techniques. The PRF as described by Shokrun or the PRGF by Anitra Aldecoa. The growth factors provide better healing, anti-inflammatory and pain reliever effects and make the bone graft sticky mixture easy to manipulate and apply to the decorticated bleeding of the other bone. So we definitely like to use them in any uh, situation we, we, in which we do grafting. The sequence that we like to use in this case is, is the one described by Dr. Secchi. We like to start with an initial round wire followed by square or rectangular thermal activated night eye wires to level and align teeth. Rectangular stainless steel arch wires are used during the working stages of treatment. Of course, treatments of patients with corticotomy can be carried out also with other type of appliances like lingual or invisible aligners. The difference with a conventional treatment is that patients are to be seen for checkups no more than every two weeks. PFO segmental and PFO extended have similar surgical orthodontic management, but different cleaning objectives and indications. So at this point, we would like to show you some cases. Cases in which we have tried PFO. And let's start with the segmental. We have tried this in complex orthodontic tool movements where we want to reduce anchorage needs. And the first attempt many years ago in which we have used PFO has been in the upper molar distalizations in adult patients, class two borderline cases where surgery was not accepted and also extractions were not accepted by the patients. And being adult patients, little or no cooperation was expected. The original protocol was to level and align upper and lower arch up to an 1825 stainless steel arch wires, produce the segmental on the corticotomy on the upper molars that we wanted to distalize, in this way with a full thickness flap, both buccal and lingual, as you can see here. At that time, we were using burrs, so we were doing holes today, we definitely prefer to do scraping. And as I said before, the segmental corticotomy was, doing, uh, was done on both sides, labial and palatal. Following the surgery, we were inserting compressed night eye cords between the second premolar and the first molar to distalize with no anchorage in the front. And these were what we wanted to achieve. Let me show you one of the first cases where we treated it. 
a full class two adult dentition. You can see here in a Panarex in a Ceph. Of course, the first thing we did was to extract all third molars. And you can see here the patient after the extractions. And these are this, this is the sequence in, by which we treated the patients. No anchorage in the front, no class two elastics. And you can see here we were able to distalize in a bodily fashion the molars without losing anchorage in the front. You can see here the only anchorage that was lost during the treatment was the rotation of the upper second premolars. In 14 months, we were able to treat the patients. You can see here the pictures before and after treatment. No cooperation asked to the patients. Final x-rays and tracing. Today, the protocol is a little different. We are using suffragating brackets. So we are leveling a line up to a 1925 stainless steel arch wires. We are doing the corticotomy as we are doing today with the piezo and with the grafting. And we are applying the uh, compressed coil at the corticotomy. This is one of the cases we're treating in this way. You can see class two missing upper central because of an injury. You can see the x-rays at the beginning of treatment. The surgery different than with the piezo blades. We're not doing the holes anymore. And on top of this, if we need it, we do the grafting. You can see the sequence. Very short time of treatment. Little cooperation as to the patient. We have tried also the PFO, the segmental PFO, also in the lower molar mesializations. In cases that we see very often in our practice, young adult patients with missing first permanent molars, normally revolving third molars, and with little or no cooperation given by the patients. We know that to mesialize molars is quite difficult, especially in the lower arch because of a very thick cortical bone and also because it's um, biomechanically, it's quite difficult to mesialize lower molars. The expected tooth movement is no more than half a millimeter a month. In this F, we have no uh, bone ch changes in the bone. Let me go back. In this, if we have no major changes in the bone where we want to move the molars, if we have changes like described by the Siebert's classifications or the Allen's classifications, either buccolingually or apicocoronally, then they become quite difficult. We do know from uh, the few papers that have been published on this subject, like this one published by Pedro Leitao, um, 36 patients in which uh, all four first permanent molars were extracted at the orthodontic treatment. You can see that the average treatment time was 24.9 months, but the range was quite wide, from a minimum of 18.3 months to a maximum of 37.1 months. Big difference. So it may take three years to close um, first permanent molar space. And also, as you can see from this paper, we can easily lose law anchorage in the front and lose the dental midline. The protocol we use in these cases is very similar to the one that we use in the distalization cases. Let me show you one of the cases, typical case that we see in our practice. You see the missing force first permanent molars. Look at the x-rays at the beginning of treatment and the tracing. Look at the space that we need to close if we want to mesialize the lower second permanent molars. And look at the changes because the extractions of the first permanent molars had, has happened many years before. See, it can, it can be very difficult to, dis, to mesialize these molars. So in these cases, as you can see, we perform the corticotomy, buccally and lingually, on the molars that we want to mesialize, and also on the um, area 
where we want to move the molars. And at this point, we have a video. In this short video, as you can see, after the corticotomy performed on the lower second molars, in these cases, we like to add grafting of bone and growth factors, membranes, to help with the uh, mesialization of these molars. After the corticotomy, as you can see, we have placed the brackets and the arch wires. We have been seeing the patients every two, three weeks and doing the things that we usually do in six to eight weeks. And you can see how the case proceeds very nicely. And you can see also how easily it has been for us to move the upper and lower second molars. Look at the changes in few weeks of treatment. At this point, we have re-evaluated the cases. We have taken a new set. And we have seen that we were losing anchorage a little bit on the lower incisors. So at this point, we have taken the lower brackets with the CCO prescriptions, prescriptions of minus 6. We have rotated the brackets upside down in order to have a plus 6 torque and be able to increase a little bit the anchorage in the lower anterior area. And at this point, we have finished the case, as you can see here. So we have been able to go from left to right with a very simple mechanics, no anchorage in the front. And we've been able to finish the case in this point. And we have sent at this point the patients to a good dentist because he needed. So we've been able to go in few months from up to low and from uh, this area, from this slide on top to the one in the lower. No cooperation as to the patients, no anchorage in the front. You can see here in the sequence of panorex. The one at the end, you see no root resorption, no major problems. The set at the beginning, during treatment, at this point we rotated the, the uh, lower brackets and we were able to close the space and finish up the case in this way. And you can see we've been able to mesialize upper and lower second morals without changing the profile of the patient. Actually, we were able to achieve a little bit of auto rotation of the mandible. We have tried periodontally facilitated orthodontics also in open bites in young adult patients. This is one of the patients we treated. The patient had an open bite and a constricted upper arch. And you can see here from a close up of the smile, the patient, even if he was a young patient, was not able to show the upper teeth completely. He was showing the lower teeth, so we didn't like that. We wanted to uh, correct the, uh, the open bite by extruding the upper front teeth. These are the initial x-rays. We expanded first the upper arch with a rapid pilot expander. Then we placed a low parallel bar to get some vertical control of the molars. You can see from the PA left and right that we were able to expand bodily the upper arch and the teeth. At this point, we place the brackets in the upper arch. We um, perform a corticotomy in the upper anterior segments. And we gave the patient some vertical rubber bands. And we were able to achieve this result in a very short period of time. And you can see now how the patient is showing the upper front teeth. And this is the patient at the end of treatment. We have tried also this uh, approach with transpositions, especially in the aesthetic area, with or without uh, temporary anchorage devices. Let me show you one of the cases. It's a little girl. She had a, a transposed upper left canine. So at this point, we expose the canine. And as you can see here in the lower left, 
the um, root of the first premolar was in the way. So I asked the uh, surgeon to perform a corticotomy all around the root of the upper canine. We placed a bracket on the canine and a tad in the uh, anterior area, as you can see, we placed a force on the canine. And at the same time, we placed on the upper left first premolar a lower second premolar bracket to produce a paddle root torque. And this is the sequence. As you can see, we're able to correct the transposition in a very easy way. At this point, we took a CBCT scan. As you can see, the um, first premolar was nicely torqued toward the palate, and the canine is way out, jumping measly to the first premolar. We got scared a little bit at this point, but we placed the right bracket on the right teeth, so the canine received his bracket and the upper first premolar received his bracket with the proper torque. We are now trying to torque the root of the canine in with a worn key torque, and we were finally able to finish up the case in this way, in a very nice way. We tried PFO also to close anterior diastema in adult patients. Patients like this had a large frenum, a defect between the two centrals. As you can see here, we were not able to solve the situation just with the prostodontics because the spaces and the arrangements of the teeth in the anterior area was not proper. So at this point, as you can see here from the panorex, we needed to close a large diastema in the patient. As you can see here in the CBCT scans, and also some periodontal problems on these teeth. So I send the patients to, sorry, let me go back. So at this point, we took impressions, we sent it to the aligned comparison to get a clean check of the situation and see, to see also if we were able to close these spaces with aligners. We took impressions of this patient, of the situation, and we sent them to the Align Corporation uh, for a clean check to see if we were able to close this diastema with uh, aligners. And it seemed that we were able to do that. At this point, we performed the corticotomy in the anterior segment. We removed also the frenum. We placed a large graft on the anterior segment with the composite bone with growth factors. And after a week, we gave the patients the aligners. The patient didn't allow us even to place the attachments. So we were just able to use aligners with no other um, possible thing. Uh, to increase the anchorage of the aligners on the teeth. We asked the patient to change the aligners every four or five days instead of the usual two weeks. We gave the aligners at the beginning of July, and the patients came back at the beginning of September with this result, as you can see. We were able to close the diastema very nicely in a quite bodily fashion. And look at the amount of tissue that we were able to produce in front of the roots of these incisors. Now we were able to send the patients to the prostodontist because their teeth were in the proper position. The prostodontist produced a provisional from lateral to lateral, and he was able to place it on the teeth of the patient. That was very happy. So we were able to solve this diastomy in only two months' time. We took also new CBCT scan, and we were, we, we were very happy to see that we moved from this initial situation that you can see here in this slide to the following situation in this other slide. 
look at the amount of bone that we were able to produce and make in front of the roots of the incisors that were so nicely bodily moved. PFO is usually done again in any impacted tooth because when we expose a tooth, we are already there during the surgery, so it's very easy for a surgeon to produce a little bit of corticotomy around the canine to expose. And it works. This has been shown and demonstrated in a um, paper published in 2007 by Fisher, where six patients with bilateral impacted canines were treated on one side with a corticotomy and on the other side without corticotomy. And Dr. Fisher was able to show that on the corticotomy side it was a lot easier and much faster to move, and these include the impacted tooth. Let me show you one of the cases in which we have uh, tried the PFO segmental. In this case, with a very difficult impacted lower canine that was a left canine that just went to the right side. Look at the low position of the canine in the ceph and in the parex. So we expose the canine, as you can see here on the lower left. I asked the surgeon to produce a large corticotomy in the um, uh, path that the canine was supposed to follow during the, this inclusion. We kept the canine low and we were able to move it very nicely to its final position, as you can see here. And this is the final result. PO4 can be used also in extended version. Usually we like to use this either in the anterior expansion or in the upper and lower arch expansion in adult patients with critical periodontal support. Let me show you the first example, anterior exp expansion. This is a patient that had already been treated twice before coming to our office. This is the result after two treatments. And you can see that she had major problems. Ideally, she was a surgical case, but she did not accept surgery. So the first thing we did was to extract the third molars, then a center to the periodontist. She got some hygiene sessions, so we were able to improve already the condition of the periodontal status in the front area. At this point, my surgeon decided to do some corticotomy in the lower anterior area. On this patient, I sent it to the periodontist, my surgeon, and we decided to perform a corticotomy with grafting in the lower anterior area, and I'll show you a little later for what reason. As you can see here, the surgeon performed the vertical interproximal cut followed that by the horizontal subapical cut. These are really important, and it's very important to extend the corticotomy all the way to the apical area. Okay. Surgeon has to be quite aggressive in this situation. And of course, to the, this vertical and horizontal cut, we always add some scraping of the entire buccal cortical plate. What we want is a nice bleeding bed that will be hosting the grafting. Notice how easy it is to perform the cutting with the piezo blade. Following the corticotomy, the surgeon has placed the hard tissue grafting mixed with the growth factors. Look how sticky mixture is the bone graft with the, with the growth factors. How easy for the surgeon is to place it. Mm -hmm. 
wherever he needs it, wherever he wants it. After the bone graft, surgeon has placed the membrane of a growth factor on top of the active sugar grafting and on top of all of this we have a very thick matrix of collagen that we help to regenerate not only the bone, but also the soft tissue on top of the roots of the close roots of the lower incisor. The matrix is sutured with resorbable sutures. And on top of this, we have to suture the flap and be sure that the flat has no tension on the grafting material. So in this point, we go back to the presentation. This is the patient a week after the surgery, the corticotomy and the grafting. You can see how better it looks in the front. And of course, at this point, we have started the orthodontic treatment. You can see uh, pad placed in the palate to move the upper right second molar from the buckle to the occlusion with the lower right second molar. Very simple sequence of arch wires, the one that we described before. We did some stripping in the upper and lower arch to reduce the overexpansion of the arches. In a very short period of time, we were able to go from uh, the above pictures to the lower pictures and change the arch form in both the upper and the lower arch. These are the patients. Quite at the end of treatment, we took a panorex to control the final result. Death, you can see the change of the synthesis. And you can see also the change in the torque of the lower incisors thanks to the minus six torque that we have in the CCO prescription. And here's the patient at the end of treatment. So you were able to achieve such a treatment and such a result in a very short period of time. The patient at the beginning of treatment and at the end of treatment. Look at the changes in the lower anterior area, beginning surgery, few weeks after, a week after the surgery, and at the end of treatment. You can see in the PA, the changes in the arch form and in the transverse dimension. And now we took a CBCT scan at the end of treatment, almost the end of treatment. And you can see that what was seen in the CEPH was confirmed in the CBCT scan. Look at the picture in the lower right lateral incisors before and after treatment in the central incisors, the other central incisors, and the lower left lateral incisors. Great changes in the lower anterior area. Finally, let me show you a case where we use PFO in an extended version. We like to use this in cases, instead of using uh, surgical assisted rapid palate expansion, because the SARPE needs hospitalization, needs bulky appliances, and may produce anterior diastema that is not liked by the patients. On the other side, when we use PFO, we are able to do the surgery and place the brackets right away. The patient doesn't need hospitalization and everything else can be done in local anesthesia. This is one of the patients. They came to us and other uh, orthodontists and surgeons have proposed 
at that actually surgery, but the patient didn't want to do surgery because he had already been treated for a few years by different orthodontists with such a result. So first of all, we extracted the third molars. We took a CBCT scan to evaluate nicely the patient. And you can see here the deficit of bone, especially in the premolar area on both sides. We proposed the patient to be treated with PFO extending in the upper arch. And this is the patient after a week after the surgery. And at the, the day we decide to re, uh, remove the sutures, we place the brackets in the upper and lower arch. At this point, we just follow the usual sequence that we have in the CCO system, a round wire followed by square nitide thermal activated arch wires, and we slowly, slowly, we try to coordinate the upper and lower arch, expanding the upper arch and constricting the lower arch with a little stripping. And you can see here, with a very short period of time, with a very simple mechanics, we were able to solve the cross pipe and close the anterior diastema. With no cooperation from the patient and with a very, very um, easy mechanics. And this is the panorx before and right before the end of treatment and uh, Seth, the beginning of treatment, and by the end of treatment, you can see the closure of the bite in the anterior area. So after all these uh, examples, screener examples that I have tried to show you, let me conclude that corticotomies are not all the same. We definitely agree on that. And definitely corticotomies are not for every patient. Orthodontists and surgeons have to be very careful in uh, finding the right indication, the right clinical case to, to be treated with these procedures. And what, what have we have tried to, what I've tried to show you, and that's our idea, corticotomy, we do think that definitely may accelerate the movement and reduce treatment time. But these are not the main reason why we use it, because we do believe that they are highly unpredictable. So PFO for us is just a way that can help us to modulate, control, and enhance orthodontic tube movement and improve orthodontic and periodontal results. But again, proper evaluation, clinical indications, and biomechanical manage management of patients treated with PA4 are essentials if we want to be biologically and ethically correct, consistent in our results, and patients friendly. Results may be improved when compared to conventional orthodontic treatments if these combined orthodontic and periodontal procedures are used wisely. That's very important for us. And with this, I conclude my webinar. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, thanks again for your kind attention.